I'm Miguel Marocco, and today I'll talk about the fundamentals of machine learning for neuroimaging. The outline of my talk is the following. I'll first start by giving a short introduction to machine learning. Then I'll talk a bit about decoding, which is predicting behavior from brain images. Then I'll cover how we can do machine learning from functional connectivity. I'll touch a bit about topics on population imaging, and I'll discuss for some aspects of advanced machine learning. So let us start with a quick introduction on machine learning. So machine learning is really about adjusting models for prediction. To give a simple example, I can have pictures of my friends that I um, took during my holidays, and I want to teach the computer to associate the pictures to the names of my friends. So for this, I'll take my existing pictures, and those are noisy, and I'll train the computer to do this association, and then the challenge will be given a new image. Uh, can the computer conclude on the name of the friend associated to the new image? So this, in practice, involves these days simply picking up software such as scikit-learn, and instantiating the models, giving the models the data and the prediction target. And I can fit this on the train data and I can test on the test data and have predictions. So it's sim as easy as a few lines of Python code. However, I'd like to cover a bit the concepts that go behind this. This can also be applied directly to neuroimaging data uh, using a variety of software such as Nylearn for MR images or MNE for MEG and EEG. Now let me introduce a few concepts and let us start with a very simple machine learning method. So going back to our problem of those images and teaching the computer to recognize the names on the images, what I can do is that I can store all the known noisy images and names that go with them in the database. And now, given a new noisy image, I can just look for the image that is most similar. This is known as the nearest neighbor method, and it's a real method in machine learning. Now, how many errors will it do on images that I have already seen? Well, Let's think about it. It has already seen those images, so it can't make a mistake because it knows the name that is associated to it. So the answer is no error. And this really is revealing that test data is different from trained data. New data that comes in is more difficult than data that I have already seen. So this is a statistical model, by the way, but it's not explicitly a statistical model in the sense that it's not a parametric statistical model. We can look at a simpler problem, the problem of regression. I want to explain a variable y, such as the age of someone, as a function of a variable x, such as the height of that person. So I can fit a linear regression to this data. This is not fundamentally different from classical statistical models. Now I can fit more complex models, and we often do. Now, which of the models above should we prefer? One actually fits the data better than the other. The wiggly line fits the data better than the other. But our intuition is that we should prefer the straight line. Why? Well. If I take new data and then I look at the error in the new data, well, the straight line will give me less error than the wiggly line. So once again, our goal here is prediction. We want a good description of a new data. And a good model is one that gives me this good description. So minimizing the train error, as we've seen before, doesn't give me the best generalization. In practice, I will have to do trade-offs. And this is the notion of regularization that is crucial to machine learning. The idea is that I will have to adapt model complexity to the richness of the data. For instance, by preferring smoother line instead of more wiggly line. 
these are more likely to generalize well. Now, I may have other features. For instance, to predict the age of someone, I may look at the age of his parents. And now I get a more complex model that can work better because it has more information. However, it has more features. So I need to think about it if I want an intuitive picture as a fit in multi-dimension. Now, the problem is that this requires more data. The more dimensions I have, the more data I have. So as I add features, I will need more and more and more data. This is known in machine learning as the curse of dimensionality. The more, the richer my data, the more data I need. Now, what if I have a classification problem? Y is not the age, but it could be gender, or it could be anything that is described by discrete variables. It's said to be categorical. Now, I should fit an adapted model to this, not a straight line, but for instance here, a sigmoid. And this is done using what's known as a logistic regression. In 2D, with more features, it looks like this here. What you can see is that the, the logistic regression is actually learning a separating line between my two uh, clouds of points in that represent both classes. In 2D, we can really see this as a separating line. So really what we're, we're learning is we're learning frontiers between clouds of points that are from one class or another class. A support vector machine, which is a popular model also, works very similarly. It focuses on the frontier and it may focus on the data points that are close to this separation boundary. Typically, those models will build the discriminant patterns by combining a few examplars of data that are close to the border. Now, that may be important to keep in mind because it means that my decision might be driven by only a few exemplars. Now, both the logistic regression and the SVM have a hyperparameter to tune this, but typically the default value works well. Now, how do I validate that I have a good model? Only performance on new data can evaluate a model prediction. A good model, by the way, if we want to write statistics on this, will estimate the conditional expectancy of y given x. This is the statistical quantity that the machine learning model targets. So how do I know that I have a good model that will estimate this conditional link well, that will estimate the probability of y given x well? The way I'll do this is I'll split some data out. I can leave typically 10%. And I'll train a model on the train set, so the fraction of the data that I've kept. And I need to train every aspect of the model. And then I'll evaluate the prediction error on my test set that I've left out and that I've never touched. The typical good choice of the amount of data to leave in the test set is 10%. And so then I can redo this many, many times, each time taking 10% of the data out, leaving it, training my model on the remaining 90% and testing on those 10% test sets. This is known as cross-validation, and it's a standard procedure in machine learning. Now, there are common errors in cross-validation. The first one is that all operations needed to fit the model must be done on the train set only. So, doing a data reduction on the full data, doing a data transformation, doing feature selection, doing parameter selection, all these will bias my estimation of the model performance. Another common error is that testing several models with cross-validation and picking the best one will give an optimistic and unreliable estimation of model performance. Now, this is a common error because 
it is easy to try many models out, for instance, while working on a publication, and pick the one that works best. If I do this, I can no longer trust my cross-validation to give me a reliable estimate of model prediction, of model performance. These errors are easy to do and they're often encountered in studies, so you should be aware of them. Now, the way cross-validation works and the way any evaluation of predictive model works is that it applies the predictive model to a data set and measures the error. So, suppose that my test data set has 30 exemplars, 30 samples, I will get a distribution of measured error that is noisy because I've seen only 30 samples. And here I've shown you this distribution and we can see that it's actually pretty wide. Uh, it extends plus, almost plus and minus 15% on, on the, around the true value of the model prediction. So the, the, the challenge here is that if I'm given only 30 samples, it's very hard for me to know if a given model predicts well or not because it's like rolling a dice only 30 times. I cannot guarantee very precisely how balanced the, di is, the dice is. I need to sample this more. So, of course, this problem goes down if I get more data. If I have a hundred samples in my test set, then I only have an error of plus and minus 10%. If I have 300 samples, then I'm down to plus and minus 5%. However, those numbers are quite large by typical traditional brain imaging standards. So it's really important to keep in mind that it is hard to measure the prediction accuracy of a model we can easily be data limited on this. And this is really a problem because if I vary trivial aspects of my model, I will see, I will observe this experimental evaluation of the accuracy to change a lot. Here, what I have done is that I've, I've taken a standard um, uh, decoding pipeline and I varied trivial aspects of it. I varied the smoothing, I varied the choice of using an SVM or logistic regression, I varied the various arbitrary choices in feature selection, and what I'm plotting here is the distribution of the uh, cross-validation scores that I'm observing. And we can see that it's really very broad, and on this specific data set I have shuffled the labels so that the prediction accuracy is 50%. I cannot predict better than chance. And so what we're seeing is that if we were to pick the best performing model on this data set, we would report, for instance, a prediction accuracy of 71%. Although, there's no information in this model, in this data. What, if, what has happened? Well, by changing arbitrary things and picking the best model, We've just sampled the noise of our evaluation. So this is very dangerous. When small ends, by chance, some analytic choices give seemingly good predictions. Now, a maybe a related trend that is worrying is that in the brain imaging literature, if we look at predictive models, for instance, predicting pathologies, what we see is that the reported prediction accuracy of the model goes down with the sample size. The more data I have, the more data people have, the less likely they are to report a good prediction accuracy. Given what we've just seen that arbitrary modifications give by chance seemingly good predictions on small data sets, this trend is worrying. 
And my conclusion is that we should, as much as possible, work on large data set to have reliable evaluations of our prediction accuracy and be confident in our results. Now, to conclude on this small introduction on machine learning, machine learning are models that are used for predictions. They may be absolutely standard statistical models, such as linear regression, but we're using them for prediction. Their model complexity must be balanced with data richness. The validation must be done on unseen data, and this validation is noisy. So we need to compare the model benefits that we get with the error bars as we're trying to improve our pipeline. Now, let's just talk a bit about brain imaging and the kind of applications machine learning has on brain imaging. Typically, the problem is to relate brain to behavior and pathologies. So on the one hand, we have measurements of brain activity. On the other hand, we have descriptions of behavior or pathology. And we may try to predict this behavior from the brain, in which case we're doing automated diagnosis or automated interpretation of brain images. We may try to explain the brain imaging, the brain activity, from the description of behavior, in which case this is useful to decompose behavior, and this is known as encoding. We may be interested only in the brain imaging, in which case we will typically look at resting state data and we will try to intr extract intrinsic structure of brain activity. This is done using unsupervised machine learning, which I haven't covered in my introduction to machine learning, and that has X data but no Y target. We can also apply unsupervised machine learning to descriptions of behavior or pathology, in which case we'll be trying to extract semantics or some form of representation of knowledge of those descriptions. And this is useful to relate behaviors, for instance, discover large cognitive domains, or pathologies, for instance, find important comorbidities. And once again, this is done with unsupervised machine learning. So, machine learning can be used in many aspects of brain imaging, and I'll cover a few in the following. Let me focus a bit on decoding. Decoding is the task of predicting behavior or pathology from brain images. Typically, this is done with linear models, and the reason is that input data MR images has a huge number of features, dozens of thousands of voxels at least, and quite often we only have a small number of samples in our training set. So we need to use the simplest possible models, and those are linear models, to limit complexity and to limit the noise that our model will capture. Now, a nice aspect is that the coefficients of those linear models are actually brain maps. So, really the linear model is learning a set of weights that it can apply to the input data to best predict the target. And those set of weights are brain maps. They're decoding maps and they can be useful for interpretation. So, here we can look at brain maps in a decoding task, a historical decoding task, where we're trying to discriminate whether the subject is viewing faces or houses in a visual recognition task. And here we're using a support vector machine which achieves 26% error rate. So we can use a different model, a sparse model, which achieves only 19% error rate. And we can see that it really focuses on tiny parts of the brain. Or we can use a ridge, which achieves even smaller a fraction of error. 
15%. However, so we're very happy with these 15%. It's, a, it's the lowest error that we've observed so far. However, we expect, we expect the well-known phase-specific regions, the fusiform phase area, to be selected by the ridge. But this best predictor does not segment them well at all. So, what's going on here? Let us look a bit at the mathematical problems that underlie the extraction of decoding maps. So, our problem is that of an inverse problem. We're trying to go from the data to find the brain maps that predict well the output. And in general, for this, what we're doing is that we're minimizing the prediction error. However, so we're finding the map, which I'll call W. We're finding the map W that minimizes this prediction error. And the problem is that given that we only have a limited amount of data, there are many different W which will give the exact same prediction error. And out of all those Ws, the data doesn't tell us how to choose. So the choice that the decoder makes is driven by its priors, which may be implicit. And so the different decoders that we may have have different priors. And given that the data by itself is not enough to distinguish the different maps, then it's really the decoder itself that imposes its prior. So for instance, a sparse decoder will choose a sparse map because it's part of its prior. And it means that we can only interpret the maps understanding the priors of the decoder. And there is a type of prior that is well adapted to neuroimaging, which are the spatial priors, as in the TVL1 decoder that I've shown here. And those tend to uh, prefer structured maps that segment well regions of the brain. The way this is done is by a total variation penalization. And what this total variation penalization does is that it imposes sparsity, but not on the image, rather on the spatial gradient of the image. And by doing this, it will tend to prefer images that have a fairly smooth gradient and give output images that segment regions. So we really have a challenge here is that different decoders will give different regions and the data cannot tell us. It's a nil pose problem and we simply with a given data set cannot say which of those many maps are those that are best adapted to the problem. So let me quickly introduce you to our best performing decoder so far. And let me also tell you why this is the decoder that we prefer so far. The ID departs a bit from the total variation decoder because the total variation decoder was very slow. And so what we're doing here is that we're um, running very fast models, very fast decoders that are suboptimal. We know because uh, they're not solving a very complex problem that they are suboptimal. But we're perturbing the data and we're averaging many of these. This is known as an ensemble method in machine learning. So technically what we're doing is that we're learning a parcellation on perturbed data, on perturbed brain imaging data, and each time we're estimating a linear model. And we're doing this many, many times each time we're perturbing a bit differently. And then we're averaging the result. And the goal of this parcellation, which is extracted from the data, is to impose some spatial structure on our data. And so if we, if we do this, we call this uh, model FREM. What we've done here in this publication is that we've evaluated this model 
over a huge number of different studies. Now, by itself, a single study only brings us weak evidence that the model is a good one because we only have limited data. But given that we've applied this over many, many studies, each of the dots is a study, what we can see is that we can see trends. And we can see over many different models, we can see that frame tends to outperform the other. So in general, we believe that it is preferable. We're also interested in whether the maps that we have are trustworthy or not. So we looked at the stability of the maps and we can see that frame tends to be more stable than the other maps. So there's less arbitrary aspects in the way that it chooses its map. Finally, we can look at computational time and we can see that frame tends to be reasonably fast, not the fastest model, but significantly faster than TVL1. So this is one reason why we prefer Frem, why we like Frem, and why we are uh, putting it in the latest versions of our libraries. <clears throat> so let us take a step back and let us think about the type of inferences that we do when we do cognitive neuroimaging. We ask questions such as, what is the neural support of a function? But also, what is the function of a given brain module? We would like to be able to attribute functions to brain structures, associate them with mental processes. The way brain mapping works is that it works by task-evoked activity. We're going to present task conditions to a given subject, and each time those task conditions will recruit a given brain activity. And we're going to vary those task conditions. And by doing this, we're going to do elementary psychological manipulations. And we're going to create contrasts that hopefully isolate effects of interest. Now, when we're doing this, the differences in brain activity that we're observing are consequences of the task. So, we cannot really guarantee that a given brain module implies a given function, but rather that a given function, a given task, implies the activity of a brain module. So, this is why the type of conclusion that we might be interested in terms of what is the function of a given module is known as a reverse inference. And in general, from standard brain imaging results, we cannot do those reverse inferences. Now, one approach to tackle principled reverse inference is to use a decoder to predict the output. This is, for instance, being done to characterize the fusiform face area in the work by Henson and Halchenko uh, because the specificity of the fusiform area uh, is put in question because it actually responds to uh, many uh, stimuli and not only faces. More generally, the idea is to use decoding to find regions that predict observed cognition. And these will support reverse inference in some way. But for to have a good uh, reverse inference, we need to show that this prediction is quite general. And for this, we need a large cognitive coverage. What, that, what I mean by this is we cannot only afford to have an opposition between two conditions, because if we have this, we haven't really covered all the possible cognitive operations of the brain, and we cannot do a general statement on the function of a given brain module. I have talked about this in the context of cognitive neuroimaging, but this is a more general problem, and it's also relevant to study pathologies, in which case the, the question that we face is, what is the specificity of spatial differences 
we observe it in the brain in the face of comorbidity. And there are a lot of reverse inferences uh, that are happening uh, over interpreting uh, spatial differences observed um, due to pathologies. <clears throat> now, the best way of mapping the neural support of um, a given mental process is to combine forward inferences. These give us non-specific associations. However, the use of contrasts help us reject very well confounds. So we can build contrasts, for instance, to map the place recognition uh, mental process. And then we can combine this with reverse inference, which will give us some form of specificity in the sense that regions that predict place recognition will be used by the decoder. However, as we can see here, the decoder will also pick up noisy signal because it doesn't know well how to, to reject compounds. This is The way this can be explained is that it uses this noisy signal to remove signal from the regions of interest. This is well explained and well understood and can be tackled with causal reasoning as in Weichfeld et al. And the best way of outlining a specific brain region is really to combine forward inference and reverse inference in a consensus map. And we can see here that this outlines best the um, place recognition, uh, the regions that are involved in place recognition. So, to summarize on this uh, part, uh, predicting behavior from brain images, we will mostly use linear models because we seldom have enough data. And typically, we don't have enough samples to know, to, to, to control well the, the, the decoding maps, and so the prior that we use on those linear models is crucial. And the priors that work well are typically the TVL1 prior or the FREM prior. Decoding can be useful to support reverse inference associating a brain structure to a behavior. However, decoding maps must be interpreted with some skepticism in the light of the prior. And it's important to understand their limitations. I would like to quickly touch about how we can predict from functional connectivity. The challenge here is to relate ongoing activity to, for instance, behavioral traits. And the first challenge is that resting state in itself has no salient feature. So there is a canonical pipeline that has emerged over the years, which consists in first defining regions or distributed networks then extracting representative time series, then capturing their interactions in an interaction matrix, and finally using supervised learning to link this matrix to behavior. Now, there are many choices at each step. Which one is best? Recently, Dadi et al. ran an extensive benchmarking study across many different cohorts to find trends and to inform this choice of various steps. Let us, for instance, start by defining regions that we need to create nodes of our functional connectome. We could be using an atomical atlases. However, I personally do not like them because I do not see the functional structures that I might be interested in. We could be applying clustering on resting state fMRI, and there's a wide variety of different clustering algorithms, or we could be applying soft decomposition models on resting state fMRI, such as ICA or sparse dictionary learning. So, the empirical benchmarking is here, and what it shows us is that there is a slight trend going from the, the worst options being the structural atlases, functional atlases being better, and the best uh, atlases being the functional soft parcellations, such as those defined by ICA or dictionary learning. 
Now, these can be very computationally expensive. So recently, what we've done is that we've provided a um, number of pre-computed um, dictionary learning maps uh, uh, computed with a very fine resolution that are known as Tifumo that are available uh, for download uh, on a website. So we want to extract time series that represent the interactions. And here, a question that always arises is, should we be doing global signal regression or not? Well, the benchmarking shows that there is pretty much no difference between one option or the other. And really, the conclusion is, as long as that there is a reasonable pre-processing, all options, all of these options, global signal regression or not, relate as well the, the brain signals to the behavior. Now we need to represent interactions, and the most natural way of doing this is to look at correlation matrices. And here I'm showing the correlation matrices of four different subjects, one of uh, which has a very large lesion. And what you can see is that those correlation matrices uh, capture indirect effects. Uh, every region is somewhat correlated to another. This is uh, fundamental property of correlation, but a consequence is that it creates extremely distributed variety across subjects because there is no coefficient of a correlation matrix that changes independently from the other. So we can look at partial correlations, and these are interesting because they focus much better on direct effect. However, they're extremely noisy, and it's hard to see differences between subjects. So one approach that is slightly more mathematical is to capture the difference from each subject to the mean of subject via what's known as the tangent space embedding. And this representation is optimized to tease out the different uh, uh, effects. And so what you can see here is that in a subject that has a lesion, uh, the effect of the lesions really stick out, whereas uh, in controls, it's basically IID white noise. So th this representation is in theory optimal for statistics. But in practice, what, what does it give? Well, what we can see here is that in practice, for predicting from functional connectome, the tangent space parameterization is optimal and gives an improvement. And finally, the last step, to use supervised learning, we experimented with a variety of models. And really what comes out is that the linear models without sparsity or feature selection are those that work best. So to wrap up, there is really a canonical pipeline that is emerging. First, extract signal on functional regions, such as extracted by dictionary learning ICA or pre-computed DFUMO maps. Then use the tangent space to compare connectomes and finally use a linear model for supervised learning. Now I'd like to touch a few words on population imaging. So really trying to predict traits and pathology across many different subjects. And there are two challenges that come to mind. One is the heterogeneity of subjects and the second is that we seldom have as much information as we would like on the outcome of interest. Is heterogeneity a roadblock? We looked at this question considering autism, which is a very heterogeneous pathology with an ill-defined diagnostic criterion and that's sensitive to the parent's socioeconomical status. And we looked at this on ABIDE, which is a cohort that was done as a post hoc, post -hoc aggregation of data across many cities and countries. And the question we asked is, can autism biomarker carry over to new sites? And the answer was pretty much yes, if we have enough data. And what we're seeing here is that predicting to a new site ends up working as well as predicting to seen site if we have enough data. Now, the catch is we need a huge amount of data, but I do not believe that heterogeneity is a roadblock if we have enough data. Now, 
The problem is we seldom have a huge amount of data with the interesting clinical outcome. So what we looked at is can we use a less interesting clinical outcome, such as brain age? And what we looked at is predicting brain aging. For this, we train our models to predict the chronological age of the subject. And so we train the best model that we can, and we get a good model that predicts well the age of the subject with an absolute error, mean absolute error of uh, 4.3 uh, 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 years. But the really interesting thing is that the discrepancy with the chronological age, that's known as the brain age delta, correlates with cognitive impairment. So what we get here is that we use the surrogate outcome, the brain age, which is not exactly what we're interested in. Well, actually, the chronological age, but training the model on the surrogate outcomes captures useful information. So the two important things I'd like you to remember are that heterogeneity is in general not a roadblock because it can be defeated by very large samples and rich models. And that the availability of the clinical or behavioral outcome on those very large samples is often challenging. And so it can be useful to use proxy outcomes that are not exactly the outcome we're interested in, but that correlate with the outcome that we're interested in. Now I'd like to cover a few aspects of advanced machine learning. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is model stacking. Model stacking is the idea that you might combine several models to do a more complicated one. And for this, what we'll do is that we'll learn a first model and then use its output as the input of a second model. So we'll learn a first model that goes from X to Z. And this, we can do it by directly using, directly supervising the model. And then we'll take the output of this first model and we'll feed it in the second model. So typically as the first model, we'll use a linear model and we'll go from very high dimensional to low dimensional. And in the second model, we may be able to use a nonlinear model because we're in a low dimensional setting. Now, there's a trick to, for this to work is that you need to control the amount of noise that is captured by the first model and, and pushed in the second model. And the way you do this is by what's known as CrossFit, is that you obtain the, uh, the input of the second model uh, in the training data by splitting the training data and only fitting the, the first model in chunks of data that are not used to train the second model. Uh, this is known as CrossFit. It's a, an increasingly important trick in statistical learning. Uh, in practice, uh, Scikit-Learn, a Python library for machine learning, comes in with the proper tool to do uh, stacking. Now, this is very useful to assemble nonlinear models from simple one. And I'll show you an illustration where we use this. Specifically, we've used this extremely successfully in brain imaging for multimodal nonlinear models. And the idea being that on each imaging modality, we will fit a linear model. And then we'll take the output of this linear model on each modality which, for instance, for fMRI, I can call an fMRI marker. For structural MRI, I can call a structural MRI marker. And then we'll combine this with a, a second level model. And the second level model, we can use a more complex model, such as a tree-based model. And so what we get here is a biomarker that is built across the different modalities. And, sorry, and one Interesting aspect is that the tree models can natively support missing values. So in our latest work, what we've done is we've done a multimodal biomarker 
that works even in the absence of certain modalities, uh, which is extremely useful because quite often in a very large cohort, some subjects didn't undergo all the procedures. So before I end, I'd like to say that all the techniques that I've mentioned uh, today are implemented in Nylearn, which is a package in Python for statistical learning for neuroimaging. Uh, it provides all you need, advanced statistics for neuroimaging, machine learning, functional connectivity, and also these days, standard GLM-based analysis. It gives the full pipeline, including data extraction, analysis, and visualization. And it's fairly easy to use, provided you know how to code in Python. It's also open source and based on an open community developed by many people in the world. So, a few things to remember on machine learning and brain imaging. Most of the time, it's better to prefer simple models and rather to focus on a good brain imaging pipeline rather than build complex models. Good evaluation of generalization power is crucial and it's easy to get it wrong. There is only weak statistical control over model parameters in machine learning. So it is easy to overinterpret them. For instance, overinterpreting decoding maps. And finally, Nylearn and Scikit-Learn implement all the methods that you need. Now, behind the success of machine learning on brain imaging, I believe that there is something actually that's fairly fundamental in the way we do science, is that these models establish their validity via their generalization, and so they can bring broader models of brain and mind association than simple statistical testing. Thank you very much.